I'd like to thank Dr. Love and Research to Practice for allowing me to speak today about new developments for the treatment of advanced melanoma. My name is Omid Hamid. I'm a medical oncologist. I'm chief of translational research and immuno-oncology and co-director of the cutaneous malignancies program at the Angeles Clinic and Research Institute. We're a Cedar sinai affiliate in Los Angeles, California. And over the last 12 months or so, we've had major changes into the options that we have for our patients with advanced disease. Uh, anytime I talk about malignant melanoma and more commonly immunotherapy, I mentioned that melanoma has been the leader in immunotherapy for all solid tumors. And a lot of what you hear here will be coming to other solid tumors. So it translates to care for all solid tumors. So it's uh, important to think of this as where we are now and where we're going. And I'll try to pepper in my discussion with what's happening in other solid tumors as we go forward. Now, as, you, as you've heard and you know, the overall survival bar for metastatic melanoma has changed a lot, even during my very uh, early career. Uh, from before the checkpoint and the targeted therapy era, with a median overall survival for metastatic or advanced melanoma of 6.4 months, till now where you see medians at six years and past. And what has done that has been targeted therapeutics and PD-1 CTLA-4 inhibition, either single agent or combination. And so what we're looking at here is trying to fine tune that what we've learned, what other options we have, and where to go. Uh, I spend a very f uh, small amount of time talking about targeted therapies with BRAF inhibitors, uh, but there's major changes that we've had here. As you know, there are three combinations that are approved, whether it's dibrafenib, trimetinib, vemurafenib, cobimetinib, or encorafenib, vinimetinib. Uh, what we have shown in randomized trials is combination therapy is better than single agent BRAF, so BRAF MEC better than BRAF. What we've also shown is that you can get long term benefit, but ultimately, BRAF targeted therapies have progressive disease. So, how have we uh, relegated that? those therapeutics. Uh, that's the DreamSeq trial. And this is a trial started and run through ECOG. Um, uh, Mike Atkins is the primary inv uh, investigator, uh, presented and recently published, looking at a randomization between starting with uh, combination immunotherapy, in, which is CTLA-4 PD-1 with abilimumab nivolumab, versus beginning with BRAF MEK inhibition, dibrafenib trimitinib, and then on progression, uh, transitioning to the other arm. So you can see arm A, combo checkpoint, arm B, combo targeted agent, and then on progression going on to the other therapeutic option. And to make it short here, what this DreamSeq trial showed was significant benefit in overall survival, uh, beginning with immuno-oncology uh, versus targeted therapies. And this has set the standard for patients who have BRAF uh, mutations and um, advanced melanoma to begin with combination uh, immune checkpoint with CTLA-4 PD-1. If you look at this overall survival curve, there's an early uh, flip. And these patients here are thought to be patients who could not tolerate uh, the amount of time necessary for immunotherapy to work. Um, and we'll talk about that later. What you looked at here in response the first line with immuno-oncology versus targeted therapy was the same. But then upon progression, uh, when you went from immuno-oncology arm A to arm C, which was targeted, the response rate was the same. Uh, but when you went from targeted therapy upon progression to combination checkpoint inhibition, you got a lower response rate. And we're not sure whether that's because disease was progressing too quickly or whether there's this I-press signature where when you have progression on targeted therapy, you become immune insensitive. And this is the I-press idea that has been brought forth by Roger Lowe and Anthony Rebus. Uh, that's a insensitivity. And so what do we do with those patients? 
here's the progression-free survivals, by the way, where progression-free survival with immunotherapy was better. And then if you come from targeted to immuno, the progression-free survival is very poor. So clearly indicating starting with immuno, except for those patients where you're not able to, whether it's because you need steroids, whether because they're too symptomatic, what do you do? And that is succumbent. Succumbent was presented uh, by Paulo Asierto uh, at ESMO 2021, was ultimately published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And that looks at uh, three arms. One is beginning with combination targeted therapy and upon progression going on to combination immunotherapy, which we now know is not the right way. Arm B was beginning with combination immuno and going to combination targeted on progression, which we know is a standard now. But what about those other patients? Could you begin with a sandwich protocol, starting with ch targeted therapies to control disease uh, for two months and then switching and then moving forward? And what we saw here, in short, is you could. And succumbent showed survival at two years better for those patients that either did the sandwich regimen or began with immunotherapy combination. Now, this was a smaller study, but what's important here is we've shown that you can begin with targeted therapy, but before you get resistance switching over. What we've also are waiting to look at here is this unlike DreamSeq, which was a huge trial done in community setting, this one had biopsies, had circulating DNA, and we're awaiting the correlates to tell us where and how to manage these patients to move forward. Just to uh, ask, what about combining IO and BRAF therapy? Well, you can combine IO and BRAF therapy, and they're uh, that's Inspire that we have down, we'll talk about later. What we've seen there is there was a trial with Vemurafenib, Cobimetinib, and Atezolizumab uh, versus just Birafamec, and that led to an approval. Uh, but when that was looked at uh, with uh, central review, didn't show a benefit in PFS where the trial itself did. And that's really moved away from being a standard. Other trials that were done that way did not show a benefit. And so uh, at this time, that is not a standard that we use. We only utilize it at times for patients where we think that we can never get immunotherapy in. The triplets of BRAF, MEK, and PD-1 have been found to be tolerable. And there are trials looking at uh, and carafenib, binimetinib, and pembrolizumab versus pembrolizumab alone. And that's a uh, the starboard trial, which is has not fully accrued yet. There's also a trial looking at the sandwich regimen uh, in a randomized fashion versus ipilimumab, nivolumab, and that's an EORTC trial. But for at this point, not a lot of survival advantage has been shown there. Not many people utilize this as a standard unless it's a patient where you feel that you could not ever get them to get both therapies. So I rarely use that. Well, the thing, I wasn't thinking so much about using them both together, you know, until progression. I was thinking about, could you just start the IO and just use two months of the BRAF and then stop it and keep the IO going? Oh, no, you cannot give... Now, there's a small trial being done by Jason Luke sh to try and see if you can give all four together. But in the past, when we've done BRAF, MEK, and anti-CTLA-4, there's been huge toxicity with colitis. So that's a, a, a no-go for standard. It's a no-go for community at this time. We really haven't shown that benefit. Please continue. Okay, great. Uh, so... The granddaddy of them all right now is the combination of ipilimumab nivolumab from Checkmate 067. And that was updated by Jed Wolchuk, as you can hear at ASCO, looking at durable clinical outcomes in patients with advanced melanoma who are progression-free at three years. What you can see to the left here is the progression-free survival in the intent-to-treat population. 
And you can see at three years, there was a significant proportion of patients that were progression-free survival uh, that had not progressed. What he showed there is their overall survival was phenomenal. They didn't need another therapy. And their melanoma-specific survival was that they didn't pass from melanoma. So this is a new endpoint, three-year progression-free survival, showing that you do really well for many years to come. And that's important here as possibly a new endpoint for our patients. That showed that most patients didn't need subsequent therapy and that at 7.5 years of data cutoff, 90% of patients uh, were alive and, and greater. So what do we take from this is that we have a huge amount of benefit with uh, either single agent or combination, and we may have a... Uh, predict there for long-term survival, which is progression-free survival at three years. What we've also took here uh, from this is that those patients that do really well are the ones that have complete response or near complete response. They never progress. And that's what we're looking into more. Those patients who have a complete response or a PET negative response with immunotherapy now are the ones that we feel are doing really well. And we have breakdowns from trials like Checkmate 67 showing that if you get a complete response, you do better in the long term than a patient that gets a partial response and significantly better than a patient that gets a stable disease. So this is a new endpoint, and for future trials are going to look at whether we can do more to push these patients who have had a long-term durable partial or stable disease towards a complete response if they're not PET negative, and that's something that will come in trials in the future. These are follow-ups from Relativity 7, which was presented and published in the New England Journal and set a standard uh, for advanced melanoma and is become as, uh, patient, uh, physicians' go-tos for patients with newly diagnosed uh, uh, malignant uh, advanced melanoma. And this is relativity. It was combination relatlimab-nivolumab uh, versus nivolumab alone. Both are given every four weeks. Both are given as an infusion over 30 minutes. Uh, previously untreated or uh, unresectable or metastatic melanoma, looking at PFS as its primary endpoint. And most recent updates showed 21-month follow-up, updated progression-free survival, and it showed progression-free survival benefit that continued to be significant many years out, even three years out for advanced melanoma. What it also showed is overall survival benefit now has not, still not significant, although in advanced melanoma, we're feeling that that's because there are other therapies in the second line, et cetera, that are pushing that up. But for progression-free survival benefit, and what we, what the last time I talked to you about is about at three years, we start to see that plateau of survival and you're seeing that better here with the relatlimab-nivolumab combination versus nivolumab alone. So hopefully as we go further out, we'll see a more significant survival advantage. And this idea of progression-free survival too, which still needs to be uh, clarified, which is what we saw here is the patients who were treated with this combination had a better progression-free survival on their secondary treatment. So there may be benefit into seeing these checkpoint inhibitors initially helping you do better upon progression. Um, there were certain nuances here that we can't get into in an hour, but what I'll tell you is uh, that we're starting to look and more and more and understanding that possibly the greatest benefit of checkpoint inhibition in advanced melanoma may be optimizing it in the first line. So is it a discussion about Oh, should I just give single agent PD-1? Should I give PD-1 lag-3? Or should I give PD-1 CTLA-4? Or are there better options? And that is triplets or quadruplets that are coming up. And I'll transition into that discussion here in other clinical trials that are upcoming. Um, let me just say, we're trying to figure out what's best for what, and the only thing that we have here in these trials that are randomized to the same 
uh, control arm is hazard ratios. So you can see here Ipinevo having a better hazard ratio for BRAF mutants, uh, relativity with lag PD1 not as good. And this idea that patients with PDL1 greater than 1% may do just as well on single agent versus combination. Clearly, there's a lot more to figure out here, but this tells us that you know, we need to do more, find better regimens, and that um, find what a predictive markers on uh, what to do with patients who are low LAG3 expressors, because those have shown a poorer response to LAG3 inhibition. Those patients who uh, are PDL1 greater than 1%. Do they really need CTLA-4 with its toxicities? Do they really need uh, LAG-3? Because in Europe, if, if you're greater than 1%, you cannot get LAG-3 inhibition in the advanced setting. There is no clear benefit there when you look at the subgroup analysis. Well, what are we doing to figure that out? Uh, we're allowing, we're looking at toxicity, and there's a significant grade three or four toxicities with ipilimumab, nivolumab versus uh, uh, relatlimab, uh, nivolumab. So for patients where toxicity is an issue, you may want to go with LAG3 inhibition. This is a slide showing us, uh, well, th that what I told you before. If you're on nevo ipi, you get a complete response or a partial response. Your survival is almost flat, doing well. Stable disease is not doing well long term. With nevo alone, stable disease is not doing as well long term. Ipilimumab is no longer a standard first line. So, how can we move these stable disease, these partial responses, to better responses, to better long term survival? Um, well, maybe it's we need a better uh, dosing of the regimens. So this is fianlimab and uh, simiplimab. I'm just showing you the early data from ESMO presented showing high response rates, rapid, deep, and durable response. And the fact that, you know, when you go to LAG3, when they've initially progressed on a PD-1 experienced patient, they're not great. Uh, so what has happened now is this data has been updated at ASCO. And it brings into question how we're taking care of patients with LAG3 inhibition. Why is that? This is fianlimab at 1,600 milligrams. That's a LAG, uh, LAG3 inhibitor that's given at a 10 times greater dose than relatlimab every three weeks, which is more frequent dosing, and also given with a PD-1 inhibitor that's more frequent. What did we see in uh, PD-1 um, untreated patients in cohort of 80 patients, and then those patients who have seen adjuvant PD-1 is important here. Uh, the primary endpoint was overall response. Key inclusion and exclusion here are similar, no uveal melanomas. What did we see here as follow-up was increased was that the response rates here are 63%. Now, these are smaller numbers than the relativity 47, but it's important to tell you that relativity had a response rate of 44%, not 63%. It's important to show you here a greater disease control rate of 80%. And what this brings to question is, are we really dosing LAG3 appropriately and as best as we can in our patients with melanoma? And in this PD-1 experience where they've seen adjuvant PD-1, what we saw here was response rates of 56% in those, in those patients who had seen adjuvant therapy. And this is important because in the past, we didn't know if we gave adjuvant PD-1, would we have a regimen to come to? And that's important because adjuvant PD-1 is becoming standard in lung cancer, it's becoming standard in uh, renal cell carcinoma. LAG3 is a target that's being looked at in multiple solid tumors, including lung cancer and renal cell and other solid tumors. So what this showed is it's a better response rate than we've seen with, with just coming back with single agent PD-1. So there's nuance here that's important. What we also saw here is tumor responses compared with historical controls that are great. 
when we took all these cohorts together of these advanced melanoma patients seeing PD-1, LAG-3 with fianlimab, simiplimab, a total overall response rate of 61%, which compares favorably with single agent PD-1, with uh, combination LAG-3 PD-1 with relatlimab, nivolumab, and even with uh, Ipilimumab, nivolumab, which had a 58% response. The caveat here is this is a phase two with 98 patients, not 300 patients. Um, but the duration of response still not reached and beneficial. The progression-free survival more similar to uh, ipinevo than relanivo. So what we're doing now is a major randomized phase three trial to find that out. So to answer, are we dosing LAG3 appropriately? Um, because these checkpoints are important. They're important in uh, T-cell exhaustion. They're important in making patients who may have initially been resistant to first-line checkpoint inhibitors uh, responsive. Forward, we have a lot of options. I'm just gonna show you a couple. Um, what about bringing CTLA-4, PD-1, LAG-3 together. Uh, there, are, there are many trials. There's a uh, relatively 48 that's being done in Europe that has yet to be reported that looked at a combination of ipilimumab, nivolumab, and relatlimab. And um, the question was, was it tolerable? It hasn't been presented. But because we have looked at ipilimumab and nivolumab, with an IL-6 inhibitor. This is a trial ongoing at my institution, NYU, Mass General, and Dana-Farber, where we're looking at four drugs. So an IL-6 inhibitor, you can understand, has the ability to decrease the risk of immune-related toxicities, but also IL-6, uh, elevated IL-6 levels have been associated with poor prognosis and resistant to checkpoint inhibition. So we're looking to push response rates and benefits and try to push people into better partial response and complete response. Uh, at the same time, we're accruing to tr uh, a trial like this. This is a, a study that's looking at a PD-1 inhibitor plus a LAG-3 inhibitor plus a TIM-3 inhibitor. So three checkpoints together that aren't CTLA-4, uh, which would possibly be better tolerated in first-line melanoma. So many first-line options, and I'll get to some more later. Uh, not to be pushed out, we talked about those patients who may not need dual checkpoint inhibition, may benefit from other approaches. This is a phase one, two trial, which is now in a phase three setting, being compared with just single agent pembrolizumab alone, of a vaccine against IDO and PDL one So a vaccine type of approach in combination with nivolumab and metastatic melanoma. The phase one study showed a high response rate. Now, small numbers of patients, but a response rate of 80% and a high complete response rate. You can see here, a majority of patients getting complete response pointed us to looking at this, and this data is coming forward. And this may bring us back to vaccines being important in melanoma and other solid tumors. What also is now at FDA and is coming forward is looking at adoptive T cell therapy with autologous tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. This is lefilocell data that showed in the heavily, heavily pretreated patients um, where you get tumor tissue itself and you make a, uh, you grow those T cells that have infiltrated into the tumor. When you bring this together in heavily pretreated patients that had three to 10 previous regimens, had failed BRAF MEC, had failed CTLA4, had failed PD1, most patients were checkpoint. Uh, resistant, so they didn't even get a response to checkpoint inhibitors. Most patients had seen CTLA-4, PD-1, et cetera, and you had a 31.4% response rate. This showed that in patients, 80% had seen CTLA-4, all had seen PD-1, an option. Uh, very tolerable. The majority of toxicity comes from the initial 
lymphodepletion with chemotherapy and the IL-2 that's necessary and a long duration of response. Now, this is something that's in clinical trials uh, and is at the FDA for approval at this point. The FDA has uh, accepted its biological license and is evaluating the data for approval. Well, where does a lot of this data come from? Most of you have seen the New England Journal article that came forward from John Hannon and others in the Netherlands where they looked at tumoral infiltrating lymphocyte trial versus ipilimumab in the second line. This is a randomized phase three trial. How does tumor infiltrating lymphocytes work? Here's how it is. Metastatic melanoma patients uh, are seen. Uh, the first thing that's done, the surgical removal of a melanoma lesion, that's taken and that's digested. And the T cells that are in the tumor are then uh, taken out of the tumor, digested and grown up. Now, why is that important? Because you get tumor-specific T cells that are targeted at not just one and tumor specific antigen, but multiple tumor antigens. And that is then grown to billions of T cells through a rapid expansion protocol. Uh, and then those are called TIL, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Uh, those are then pulled into one infusion bag. The patient themselves then is brought into the hospital and receives uh, flu -sci. Uh, this is a lymphodepleting chemotherapy. To, it's non-myeloblative. It gets rid of T regulatory cells, nonspecific T cells, etc. You are infusing the tumor-specific T cells. So that's how they get those from a single infusion of TIL. And then they get IL-2 up to six to eight doses. Um, we know high-dose IL-2 can work in melanoma, but this is it's not doing the heavy lifting here. Uh, in this trial that was done in the Netherlands, all of this was done centrally. In trials that we have, like the Lephilocell trial, it allows the tumor harvest, the beginning, and the tumor infusion, the end, to be done at a local area, the surgery done locally, and the TILs to be grown centrally. Companies like this do the rapid expansion protocol and they obviate the need to have a GCP facility at every site and allow this therapy to come to all patients. So what we saw here was in this randomized trial between TIL versus ipilimumab, a higher response rate. Uh, so the overall response, 41% uh, versus 18%. Uh, and a higher clinical benefit, 57 versus 33%. Well, that's amazing. And you say, well, why is this response rate higher? Because it was earlier, and we're getting the understanding that earlier and earlier, giving adoptive T cell through tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is important. What we also saw is progression free survival benefits here. Uh, you can see here a median follow up of uh, almost three years, a progression free survival that is at six months. Um, um, greater than double in patients who receive TIL. So where are we with this therapy? Uh, you, there's a first-line trial that's coming looking at lefilocell plus pembrolizumab versus pembrolizumab alone uh, in patients. It's a randomized study with 670 patients globally. Um, we have some early data uh, that was presented on a trial that's ongoing at this point, looking at many different types of tumors in the first line. You can see here, best overall response, 100% clinical benefit in melanoma. But here's the transition I want to make to you. That adoptive T-cell therapy with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes is uh, being looked at in cervical cancer, lung cancer. You can see head and neck cancer here and it is coming for other solid tumors. And so it's not just melanoma, but you can see here the efficacy early, 100%, uh, head and neck, 87, cervical, 85%. And head and neck cancer, cervical cancer, don't quote me on this because I'm a melanoma oncologist, but is a greater issue for the whole world. Globally, cervical cancer and non-small cell lung cancer is at issue. Um, 
And this is just a slide to say that we're doing more. Uh, this is a trial of TIL cells. They're tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but they're PD-1 knockout. So they don't, the PD-1, PD-L1 axis is knocked out. So you do not need to utilize a drug like nivolumab. And so we're looking at this cohort one is melanoma, cohort two is non-small cell lung cancer. So if you're listening to this, this is coming for multiple solid tumors, combinations are coming, newer TIL therapies are coming. So we're looking here at the Angeles Clinic and Research Institute, first line uh, checkpoint inhibition, whether on trial, combination, triplet, quadruplet, whatever, and then some type of T-cell therapy moving forward. Let's transition because you guys wanted to talk about what's the guidelines for another type of melanoma, ocular melanoma. There's not a lot to say here. If you're HLA-A2 positive, we know Tabentafusp has been approved for those patients based on overall survival advantage. This is a bi-specific antibody that targets CD3 on one end and uh, GP100 on the melanoma side. It, it showed... Uh, improvement in overall survival with hazard ratio of 0.51. It's a standard for HLA-A2 positive melanoma. So any ocular melanoma that's advanced needs an HLA-A2, and if they're positive, to be treated with Tabentafus. Here are the patients. This is the trial that was presented in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, in uveal melanoma, you saw, you saw significant overall survival benefit Despite the fact that you didn't see a lot of rhesus response, you saw tumor uh, progression-free survival benefit and overall survival benefit. And in these patients, even patients that did not respond had some form of benefit because if you looked at those patients that were progressors, the long-term benefit in patients who were progressors who sought the Bentifus was better than those patients who didn't. So in ocular melanoma, it is a standard. These are IMTACs. You can see here, these are bispecifics that target intercellular proteins that are presented. Uh, you can see here the MTAC itself targeting CD3 on the poly polyclonal T cell. And then the reason you need to check the HLA typing is the peptides that are presented by um, the HLA apparatus. And IMTACs can target uh, greater than 90% of the proteome whereas antibody bispecifics can only target 10% of the proteome. That means it's got a wider range of applicability in solid tumors. Now, with Tabentafus, the protein here is GP100. And I'm telling you that because there's a lot to understand here because these things are coming. Here is data that was presented in metastatic cutaneous melanoma with this type of bispecific in combination with just PDL1 or PDL1 plus CTLA4. So now you're understanding that you can combine these with checkpoint inhibitors. And in this population, you saw uh, response rates, you saw high tumor control. But what we've also seen, let me go back to this, that the one-year survivals are the best that we've seen in anything in small studies uh, at one year post-progression on checkpoint, okay? In patients with any type of decrease, 89% in metastatic cutaneous melanoma and 85% in metastatic uveal melanoma. So this is becoming not just something for uveal, something it's something for cutaneous melanoma. And this drug is now going to be looked at in a randomized phase three trial along with a PD-1 inhibitor versus PD-1 alone in HLA-positive um, cutaneous melanoma. What else is coming? Well, maybe there's a better bispecific, and this is IMCF-106. It's an impact that targets CD3 on one side and PRAME on the other. And this whole thing can show you, well, PRAME is expressed on a lot of solid tumors, endometrial, ovarian, non-small cell lung cancer, uveal melanoma, cutaneous melanoma. And what you see here to the right is 
clinical benefit that's been seen in uveal melanoma, cutaneous melanoma, serous ovarian cancer. We're looking at it in triple negative, non-small cell lung cancer, et cetera. You can see here when we look at it in the peripheral blood, <clears throat> when we start treating it, you can see interferon gamma induction, which increases PDL1. Uh, we see T cell trafficking into the tumor. And possibly now we're understanding that you can get those T cells in to prime and maybe boost with a checkpoint inhibitor. And the reason I'm telling you that is this trial now, which is HLA-A2 gated, uh, has started in monotherapy cohorts, but has multiple other cohorts now with chemotherapy in triple negative breast, with chemotherapy in ovarian, with MTAC combinations of tebentafus plus this frame in uveal melanoma and monotherapy expansions, looking at tumors that heavily express frame, including in sarcomas. So it's coming. And this is another type of T-cell therapy. When you talk about T-cell therapies, you're talking about TIL, you're talking about this, you're talking about possibly natural killer type of therapies that are coming forward, and also CAR-T in solid tumors, which is getting a ground. We won't talk about it, but is coming also in melanoma. And just some evaluations here in mel cutaneous melanoma are patients that have responded, that have progressed on checkpoint inhibitors uh, and other clinical trials. Interestingly, this is a trial that's courtesy of Dr. Richard Carvajal, but it is in uveal melanoma, a patient who had failed ipinevo, uh, had failed ip, uh, uveal melanoma, had failed ipinevo and other therapies, went on to bentafusp, and then after progression, because there were no other options, went back to checkpoint inhibitor therapy and had a significant response that's ongoing. So we're finding out that in those patients that were refractory, if they're treated with a drug like this, you may be able to then bring T cells in and boost again and utilize checkpoint inhibitors again. The prior therapies here you can see, ipilimumab, pembrolizumab, radioembolization, and then a bispecific MTAC and then ipinevo. So a lot to be found out. And as you know, as I told you, this can be in many solid tumors. What about adjuvant therapy? And I'm not going to delve into adjuvant stage two and stage three because that's exploding in uh, you know early melanoma. But in the metastatic melanoma setting, the Immunet study, uh, Dirk Schattenhofer and others has shown combination checkpoint inhibition to be the standard here with anti-CTLF4, anti-PD1 at full dose. Look at the relapse-free survival here. And look here. BRAF mutation status, it's helping similarly to what we saw in the metastatic setting, really in the adjuvant for patients with metastatic uh, beef uh, in the adjuvant post-resection, it's beneficial. And in the overall survival here, you're showing indications of benefit. So Immuned has set a standard for the adjuvant therapy of stage four patients. This is now standard. This is this data is irrefutable. Uh, so the checkpoint therapies have changed the whole landscape of advanced melanoma. Standard therapies include PD-1, single agent combinations, newer checkpoint combinations, adoptive T cell therapies, triplet, quadruplet, and more. And also these MTACs, uh, clinical trials, clinical trials, and understanding what predictive markers we have and really trying to push our patients to full complete response or a partial response, which is non-PET-AVID. Uh, 